Apex and the Marty Rock Show. I am so excited to have Brian Bassett on the phone. Brian uh, of Fog Hat, you also will remember the amazing career Brian's had being with Molly Hatchet, Wild Cherry. Uh, Fog Hat has a brand new album out. I've been listening to this thing for two days, and it's a really great album. Under the Influence, Brian, welcome to the show. Wow, it's great to be here. So, hey, man, tell us a little bit about the making of the record Under the Influence. How long has this thing been in the works, and, and where did you record it? Well, we, it's been in the works for actually several years now. Um, we have a studio uh, of our own in Florida. I've been a producer engineer for most of my entire career. And so we set up uh, in our what we call Boogie Motel South down in central Florida. And in between tours over the last couple of years and during the winters when we have uh, time off from touring, we gather down there and uh, work on ideas and record uh, pretty much at our leisure. And for about two years, we just accumulated tracks and had a good friend of ours, Scott Holt, came down as a songwriting partner and a participant. And once we got to a certain threshold of material that we really liked, uh, we sort of kicked it into high gear and started working on it. We brought in a, a wonderful producer, Mr. Tom Ambridge. Uh, he's a Grammy-winning producer of Buddy Guy's records and has worked with tons of people, just a wonderful man to sort of help uh, shape everything for the final release. We uh, went up to Nashville, a killer studio up in actually um, Franklin, Tennessee, called Dark Horse uh, Studios, and we camped out there for a week or two, brought in some guest stars like Ken Simmons and uh, Nick Jamison, our the original bass player and producer of Slow Ride, and just had a good time finishing the record, and just so glad to get it out now for everyone to hear. Now, I'm going to ask you about some of the new tunes, but since you just mentioned it, so there is a 40th anniversary uh, version of Slow Ride on the CD, so uh, tell us a little bit more about that. Is it anything different in the version, or did you just have special folks playing on it? Well, it was just really sort of a spur-of-the-moment thing. We knew it was an anniversary year, and we had Nick with us in the studio, and literally we just did what we do normally live. Of course, we play it at every show. Uh, but, uh, Nick, not with Nick, of course, uh, but we, uh, he was in the studio, played on the original track, and we said, let's just do a, you know, a take of it. And really, we ran it down once or twice and recorded it live in the studio. And what's interesting about that, too, uh, we had originally started working on another version uh, where Craig played on it. Uh, he wasn't at the studio at the time, but I had a bass track that I was able to fly in. So we actually have two bass guitars on there, Craig McGregor, who played on the live version of it, which was, you know, the live Fog Hat record was such a big hit back in the day, and Nick, who played on the original album version. So there's actually two bass guitars on there, which, I, which is pretty interesting, I think. And it was just really a fun thing to do. We did it in a couple takes, and it came out great. Yes, it did come out great, and uh, I think folks are really going to love uh, walking down memory lane. Remember that Fog Hat Live album with cool cutout letters live and uh, thinking back on those, those special times. So, um, hey, one of the songs I was really drawn to as my favorites was the song uh, Heart Gone Cold. So tell me a little bit more about that tune and what it's about. Well, that was um, a riff that Charlie had been working on, Charlie Hewn, our singer guitarist, for some time, and we actually had that really from one of the beginning sessions, and we kept working on it, working on arrangements on it, and I, we just really felt it was a powerful track, and um, and we kept taking it again and again, but we found when Tom Camp got involved with it, Tom Hambridge, he really helped us sort of get the arrangement together the way we liked it, and uh, and it's, I, I think it's one of the stronger songs on the record. I, it's always been one of my favorites for the last couple of years as we've been trying to get it to where we wanted it. But, um, you know, I thought we got a really good take on it on the record, and I think it's one of the stronger songs there. have to agree with you, man. It's one of the ones we're going to feature on the show tonight. And there was one more I wanted to ask you about, and, uh, and it kind of has a lot of that. I think it's the classic Spaggy kind of sound to it, and that's the tune Ghost. Uh, tell me a little bit more about that tune. The Ghost is, um, funny enough, it was a song. Uh, we do Robert Johnson's um, a song during our set, uh, Terraplane Blues. It's one of our sort of showcase uh, moments in our show, live show, with which Charlie does about a five or ten minute solo guitar introduction uh, to it, and where we get crowd participation and people sing along, and it's sort of like real down tempo, basically with the chord changes from Ghost, and and it was always in my mind as we were putting the record together that we would flesh that out into a full, you know, a full fledged song with lyrics and uh, you know an arrangement. Because it's such a highlight, and Charlie plays has such a good groove on just the guitar on it. So it's very, bar, you know, it's really bare song. It's just me and Charlie playing guitar, and it's a stompy, 
but I just really like the chords in it. It just had this kind of, um, you know, almost like old England feel. I don't know. I love something about it. And, and we sat down with Tom to work on the lyrics and, and Ghost just sort of popped up, you know, like sort of a, we just had this image of a foggy Appalachian hill, you know, and a love gone bad, you know, kind of thing. And, we had fun writing the lyrics, but it was really built around Charlie's uh, solo guitar performance from our live show. So you just mentioned the love gone bad, and you, you kind of so exactly what I was thinking about on this next question. Is I listen to the album, I don't want to call it anti-relationship, but there seems to be a lot of like a kind of broken heart, maybe uh, upset with the ex kind of themes to some of these songs, aren't there? <laughs> Well, I'm happily married. I'm, I'm, glad to say, I'm glad to say, but I didn't write any of the, most of the lyrics. <laughs> but uh, you know, it's funny. But a lot of a lot of blues songs sort of lean that way. I don't know. You know, you, you can get a lot of angst out of uh, broken relationships, and you know, I thought of, of the song. You know, I'm happy, which was one of my favorite songs last year, where you know, music is really uplifting. But you know, when you sort of go to that blues side of things, you know, you're always looking for uh, a little down and out theme, or you know, a broken heart kind of thing. But, uh, yeah, it's funny how that does come up within a lot of songs. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's kind of hard not to... Uh, I, have to I have to talk to somebody about that. <laughs> <laughs> no, it fits the blues. You're absolutely 100% right. It fits the blues. You stop. And, um, so I was reading uh, some of the press stuff that came out, and something kind of cool came out of the whole process was uh, the formation of Earl and the Agitators. Tell us about that. Well, this is, this is so funny, and it's really something that I really love, you know, being in music a long time. You know, you meet people, certain people that you just click with and, uh, and you just have a musical chemistry with. And Scott Holt is the guy that I'm talking about. He, uh, we met him, you know, at a blues award show and he played with Buddy Guy for 10 years and he's a real, um, prodigy on the guitar himself, has his own trio out there working hard. But we just started hanging out together and for some reason, when me and him sit the band together, songs just pop out, you know, I mean, it seems like I was, you know, I sit at the record desk when we work on stuff, and when we get a good idea or groove going, you know, me, Scott, and Roger sat down there for a couple of weeks just every day working on things and just jamming, and it seems like I was hitting the record button like every 15 minutes, we just kept coming up with these great grooves, and you know, so this went on for like two years that I have. I mean, we put out an EP, a four-song EP, which, you know, actually we recorded in Nashville, which I'll get that story in a second. But but really, the, the beginning of it was all this material that we had amassed with Scott. And uh, a good friend of ours, Tom Mix, is a retired colonel from the Air Force, was going to recording engineering school in Nashville at Dark Horse Institute, which is their teaching wing of the studio we used and, and how we were introduced uh, to them up there in Nashville, uh, he needed some guinea pigs for his recording project, you know, to finish his semester out, and he and Roger are like, well, we're not doing anything, and Scott lives there, well, one of the three of us go in there, and we'll be your, you know, musical guinea pigs, and you can record us, we'll come up in with some material to record, and we were so happy with the results, we actually did eight tracks there in about four days, that we just felt that we should put them out, and then we, we were uh, with the dilemma of, well, what do we call ourselves? <laughs> so, so, so I really, you know, at dinner one night, I just, I don't know why, I was thinking Roger Earl, of course, you know, but then I started thinking, how about Earl and the Agitators? You know, we're like three or four glasses of wine into this, into the evening, you know, it just popped into my head. <laughs> and then we started laughing, we said, yeah, well, like, everybody will call themselves Earl, so we have all our backstage passes are like Earl number one, Earl number two, Earl number three, <laughs> <laughs> and all our, all our guest passes say, I'm with Earl. <laughs> 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 oh, it's good to hear stuff like that. Right, yeah. so, you know, so really we just took four of the, of the best songs, there, you know, our favorite songs, and decided just put out a little EP that we can spread around just for fun, really. And But I have so much more material that, you know, you'll, we, I always say we're a secretive bunch of people, you know, but don't be surprised if we come and agitate your town and you'll be hearing some more agitator music in the near future because I have hard drives full of it. <laughs> Now, um, I know you've got a big CD release coming up at B.B. King's in New York on September 21st. Is there a reason? Uh, is there anything special about B.B. King's, or is it just a place that you decided to host it? 
Well, we've so we've tended uh, we've tended to do all our releases up in New York. I mean, a lot of our businesses there. Roger lives in Long Island, so that's the primary reason. And Manhattan's always a great place for a record release. Um, the record actually is, was you know the CD release and the digital release was there, but this is really more to celebrate the uh, double vinyl release that we're coming out with. Um, funny enough, with the resurgence of vinyl, it takes a long time to get vinyl printed these days. Uh, there's only a few companies left that do that, and. Uh, so we, uh, but it, uh, our vinyl release is going to be a double album, you know, 180 gram collector's edition, you know, uh, really sort of a, a small print run. And, uh, but it's uh, an opportunity for us to get some of our people. Like I think Kim's going to come down and jam with us. Scott's going to be there. We may get, have all kinds of guest stars come in. So it's just going to be a big party, really, just to celebrate this record that's out. And it's, you know, it's sort of a continuation of our release, which, you know, was at the end of June and, and our vinyl release, which is in September. So that's September 21st at B.B. King's in New York City, a cool venue, man. Been there a few times myself. So, uh, hey, uh, just one or two more things, and I'll let you go. I know you're traveling today. Um, I had the pleasure. Uh, we're based out of Pennsylvania, but I had the pleasure of seeing you up in Minnesota at Moon Dance Jam at that festival, and I'm so glad you guys didn't get hit by the weather. Some of the bands did, but um, you guys are still a great band. Was there, or in there, has been there in the history of Fog Hat, one region or a town that, like, you guys are the biggest in? Like, some bands just hit bigger in some towns than others. Is there one place that Fog Hat was the biggest? Well, you know, the Midwest was always totally, you know, behind Fog Hat from the very beginning in the 70s. I know Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania was a big part of it, and Chicago as well were the two big cities that broke the band back in the 70s. But, you know, it's funny, every year, you know, we do a lot of festivals, you know, that, that Moon Dance Jam, that's one of my favorites. I love going there. Not only do we get to play to a great audience and a great venue, but we also get to see a lot of our friends, you know, at the multiple day festival, which I love, you know, to see other bands perform as well. We, we seem to be doing a lot of, like, a Northwest this year, and every year it seems to be a little different, but we can always count on the, on the Midwest and, uh, you know, to really, you know, get us during festival season. We do quite a lot there, and um, we're doing a lot of uh, Washington State this year, California. So we're, we're doing – I'm getting a lot of frequent flyer miles this year. <laughs> and, but then we're doing a big run in Florida. You know, come November, we're doing a five-city run in Florida. And um, we just start board around. Uh, you know, we just – wherever our agents you know, cover their eyes and throw – the dart at the map and go, all right, you're going to Walla Walla, Washington. Go, all right, good luck. <laughs> Which I am actually going to this week. <laughs> and then we're doing a great show with uh, a Steppenwolf up in South Dakota coming up this week as well, and we're playing with ZZ Top tomorrow. So, you know, we're just having a ball out here. Well, it's impressive, the staying power of your band. And, uh, you know, when I saw you take the stage out in uh, Minnesota, just the crowd just in, in love with not only the classic tunes, but the new tunes as well, so congratulations on the release. i got to ask you one more thing, and you're probably sick of this question, but I, when am I going to get to talk to the guy who wrote uh, that amazing Wild Cherry song, play that funky music, so just tell me how the, that, that riff might have changed your career. Well, you know, when I pass away and turn to dust, that'll be like the only like nine notes anyone will ever remember I played. You know, which is a blessing. Which is a blessing, you know. But I, you know, it's funny. It was my very first record, my very first recording session, and it was the second take. You know, and that song over, you know, and it literally in a couple months became a big hit. And I was like, oh, this music thing's easy. You know, you know, forty <laughs> years later, you know, you're trying to still hit the charts. So it was just really like a, being struck by lightning. But the song itself is, even though it's funny, it's kind of auto, it is truly autobiographical. We were a rock band. We were a cover rock band, you know, and we're playing Zeppelin and Deep Purple, Fargat, you know, Kiss, and we're playing in uh, what was in a 2001 disco club in Pittsburgh, which at the time was a futuristic title. <laughs> it was a 2001, you know. <laughs> but it was turned into a big dance club. And, uh, you know, we were playing in between the DJ sets, and, of course, KC was just coming out there, BGs and, uh, um, you know, Com Commodores, Earth, Wind, and Fire were all breaking big. And we're up there playing rock music, you know, and the, as soon as we would start playing, the dance floor would clear, everybody would go get a drink. And <laughs> someone literally walked up to our drummer and said, you better start playing some funky music, white boy. <laughs> and our, our drummer walked back to the dressing room, which was actually a big industrial kitchen in this place, and I uh, told that to our singer, Rob Paris, who, who actually wrote most of the lyrics to that song that night on a, on a drink napkin. So, you know, Rob, Rob Parisi is, is credited with the, the writing on that song. He was our lead singer and band leader. But, you know, I wrote my little part there, the little opening of Funky Lick. And, 
you know, it's just really great to be part of a song like that. You never, you know, all these years later, it's still in movies and, you know, and you, it pops up. And it's, I always like to cause it. Guys that hate the band would always go, all right, I'll try this one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I used to think that song was a big hit. Even before we recorded it, we played it in the clubs, and all the guys that are sitting down, their girlfriends are going, come on, let's dance. And they're like, all right, I'll, I'll try this one, you know. <laughs> There's this kind of beat that, you know, people can get into, and, uh, you know, and it's just sort of one of those songs that, you know, who knows what, you know, kind of magic hits those three minutes of music like that to make people like it, but I'm sure glad to be a part of it. What an amazing story, man. I've had such a pleasure talking to you. You've had a fantastic career, and uh, I'm glad I'm thrilled you told me that story because I just, uh, I've always loved the song too, man, and it's been a cool one. So, uh, but the album we're talking about now is Under the Influence. It's a fantastic new album from Fall Cat. And uh, if you get up on September 21st in New York City, you can buy the vinyl version of that one and pick that up. So, um, uh, Brian Bassett, man, thank you so much for taking the time out of your travel day to be with us and uh, sharing all those uh, great stories with us on the Marmy Rock Show. Oh, well, thanks, man. It's been my pleasure.